Ladies and gentlemen of the internet, today I am bringing you a reaction video with Andrew Yang, the leader and founder of the Forward Party and a former Democratic nominee for president. Andrew Yang, I'm going to be talking about why American politics are not working and then how to fix them all within 10 minutes. What do you all think? Yes. I'm speaking here in Canada, and a friend... I think he ran for mayor of New York or something, too. ...in Canada described living here, or compared it to living in the apartment above a meth lab. <laughs> where he's getting very nervous about what's happening below him. This is actually an old trope, although, of course, being Canadians, we refer to it as living on a bear. Him ...and is starting to concern... That is being polite Canadians. The entire neighborhood. Uh, I'm going to suggest that what's going wrong with American politics is born of poor and perverse incentives that are related to a design flaw. Now, this design flaw can happily be addressed at only 2% of the cost of how much the two major parties are going to pour into this presidential cycle. Is this a UBI thing? This is, to me, the highest leverage opportunity in the world to start solving some of our biggest problems. Now, some of you may remember me as the math guy from four years ago. So there will be some math in this presentation. Uh, but I went around the US making the case that AI was going to come and change everything and that we needed to evolve our economy, adopting measures like universal basic income to prepare for the future. I founded an organization, Humanity Forward, that is still working on these ideas today, but I came to realize that nothing profound and positive will come out of the American government unless we realign the incentives within the system. So what do I mean by these incentives? What is the approval rating of US Congress as we're here together? And feel free to shout out a number even if you are not American. There's this crazy idea that's blowing up on TikTok. And I'm anchoring you low so you know it's low. I'm hearing 30. I'm hearing 20. It is lower still. It is 15%. It's been declining a bit. It's been in the 20s. Now it's around 15%. What is the re-election rate for incumbent members of the... Super high. ...the House of Representatives? Anchoring you high. You know it's high. It's higher still. It's 94%. That's a higher win rate than the Michael Jordan era Chicago Bulls, the Kevin Durant era Golden State Warriors. So how can these numbers be so disparate? It turns out that 90% of the congressional districts in the United States are drawn to be either blue or red. And the Americans here know what I'm talking about. You know which party is going to represent you before a single vote is cast. So what people imagine is that our leaders have to make 51% of us happy in order to stay in office. The truth is that only about 10 to 12% of voters participate in these primaries. And these voters tend to include some of the most ideological uh, or extreme of the bases of these parties. I have met many base voters, and let me just say they have, let's call them specific points of view. <laughs> so how can you lose your job in this system if you essentially cannot lose the general election? You can expire, that's one possibility. Uh, but the other is that you get on the wrong side of these base voters. And there were 10 Republican House members who voted to impeach Donald Trump after January 6th. How many of them made it back through their primaries? Two, in a system where you have a 94% incumbent reelect rate, only two out of 10 Republicans made it back to the primaries if they ran afoul of their base. So the fiction that most Americans have been told is, look, our leaders have to make 51% of us happy. The reality is that they have to stay on the good side of approximately 10% of their party's base voters. So this tends to bring people a bit to the sides. It changes their incentives. This is one reason why America's political parties feel like they're not listening to a lot of the public. So you have the party primaries that are stretching us toward the extremes. Then you have our media organizations that are separating us into tribes and teams. You know which teams media you're watching at any moment. And then you have social media pouring gasoline on the whole thing. And if you had to put numbers on this, you can imagine the power of these forces and they're getting stronger, not weaker. What do you all think? This is this a reasonable summary? Yeah. 
All right, so it's gotten to the point now where a US senator said this. I said, a problem is now worth more to us unaddressed than addressed. What happens if some brave legislators lean across the aisle and try to compromise and find a solution to a big, hairy problem? They worked with the enemy, they're ideologically impure, their base turns on them, and their job security goes down. Uh, interestingly enough, this, this was actually, like, this whole uh, phenomenon he's describing of, like, no bipartisanship and um, stark ideological lines was actually a lot more pronounced in previous party systems uh, during the 19th century. Um, the, it was still the Democrats and the Republicans Although then, the Democrats were the party of individual liberty, and the Republicans were the party of great moral ideas, heavily influenced by uh, Puritanism. And, and during, during the, uh, this time period, during the 19th century, uh, the, the two political parties were extremely ideological. Uh, n not so much today, where uh, you have, for example, like Mitt Romney, who's a Republican, but he's actually very liberal. Um, you you have uh, actually a lot of overlap between between positions and and uh, b between uh, the two parties and their ideas, um, but. And, and, and you also have, uh, you know, people who vote, like, Republican or Democrat. But but back in the 19th century, um, that there was much, much more divided. And instead of, you know, somebody voting for the other side, they would just stay home and, and not participate. What happens if they let the problem linger and fester? Nothing. But overall, I, I think it's pretty interesting what Andrew Yang has to say. Um can raise money, they can get votes, they can get you mad, and they have a 94% re-election rate. So you can put any major problem in this bucket, and this is why it feels like we're not making meaningful progress. You could put immigration in there. You could put climate change in there. You could put AI in there. You could put poverty in there. So have I managed to depress you all in about five minutes? <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm actually now going to get us all the way out of this in the next five. There is a real solution to this situation, and I want to give credit to Catherine Gale and Michael Porter, who co-wrote the book, The Politics Industry, who make this case. So Alaska in 2020 changed its primary process to make it so that candidates run in one primary from any party, and then the winner is chosen via ranked choice voting. This is an Alaskan ballot, and you can choose up to four candidates, first, second, third, fourth choice. Uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes just to review for the non-Americans and maybe some Americans here how the primary process ordinarily... I mean, ranked choice voting might be marginally better or making reforms in the primary system, but this is really uh, just a band-aid solution. The real problem uh, isn't, isn't that you don't have the right process for electing leaders. Uh, the real problem is that the state is a criminal organization uh, whose entire purpose is to extort the economic class and redistribute wealth to the political class. So, uh, yeah, this is this is uh, really just uh, a whole lot of ado about nothing. It works. So the way it works is that you have people running in each party. You have nominees who are chosen, and then the nominees run against each other, and the party... This is a little disappointing, because I felt like he had a pretty decent lead-up, like, he was identifying some problems accurately, you know, laying out the situation, but then when it comes to the solution, he just completely fizzled out. Uh, it was very disappointing. His dominant in that district wins, and as we saw... In 90% of the districts, you know which party is going to win that general election. In this new system in Alaska that was changed in 2020, now you have the top four candidates of any party 
get through to the general election, and then they are chosen via ranked choice voting, which we're going to go into an illustration of right now. So this change was made in 2020. I mean, you have all sorts of countries with different electoral schemes. You know, in Argentina, they've got the runoff voting, and frankly, I don't think the democratic process is working any better anywhere else. So, yeah, it can't count me out for, for this solution. 20, it applied in 2022. How many of you have heard of Sarah Palin? Somehow worldwide. How many of you have heard of Mary Peltola? Mary Peltola is the relatively anonymous state legislator who defeated Sarah Palin for a congressional seat in 2022. Now, in a conventional system, Sarah Palin probably wins the Republican primary and then probably wins the general election because Alaska is a red-leaning state. But in this new system, via ranked choice voting, Mary Peltola ends up emerging as the winner in the second round in part because a critical mass of Alaskan voters put her second. And in this same cycle, believe it or not, this is a very important race because if Sarah Palin had won, she'd be in DC right now. There'd be a TV camera presented to her just about every day and, and asking her, say something crazy, Sarah, say something crazy. And then she would say, glad to, that's kind of why I'm here. <laughs> she, would, she would say something crazy and then that would be presented to the other side and say, did you see the crazy thing Sarah said? What do you think? And that's what would pass for news and we'd all be three IQ points dumber and sadder. So that, oh, so really, so this outcome was averted by this new system. But of even more importance was that in the same cycle, Senator Lisa Murkowski was up for re-election. And Senator Lisa Murkowski has the distinction of being the only Republican senator who voted to impeach Donald Trump, who was up for re-election. After her impeachment vote, her favorability rating was measured at 6% among Alaskan Republicans. They did not like that impeachment vote. But there is no party primary in Alaska anymore. So she went through essentially to the general, and she ended up emerging as the winner because she was, again, the second choice of a critical number of voters. So this change in Alaska had profound effects within two years and it cost $6 million to adopt this reform campaign. $6 million, you know how much the two parties are going to spend this presidential <coughs> Great, so some politico gets elected instead of some other politico. How does that lower my taxes? ...cycle, $10 billion. I'm going to suggest that this $6 million is the highest impact investment any of us has ever seen, and it's evergreen. It turns out that 25 states have ballot initiative measures where you could change the primaries into this new nonpartisan primary and ranked choice voting combination that ends up realigning the incentives away from the extremes and toward the public. Nevada voted to approve the... Yeah, I'm done with this. Bottom line, uh, ranked choice voting, I mean proportional representation, whatever electoral reforms you want to make, uh, at the end of the day, what you really need is to reduce the size and scope of the state. So will that, will these new electoral systems uh, enable us to affect that change? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, so I, I, I don't think this is the, the silver bullet that, that we're looking for.